So welcome to Track Talk with Denny Sywell. I'm excited to have Denny here with me today. We're going to talk about his work with Paul McCartney and Wings, specifically Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, and uh, Live and Let Die, two great tracks with, with uh, iconic tracks with great drum tracks. So on that note, and without further ado, please welcome the great Denny Sywell to Track Talk. All right. Hello there. Welcome, Denny. Welcome to Track Talk. Great to see you. Good to be here. Thanks, John. Oh, man, a, a pleasure and an honor. And uh, long overdue, you know, to, to, to have you on a podcast of some way or shape. So this is great to have you here today to talk about some iconic Good to be here. tracks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, Denny, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to play... Um, Uncle Albert, <clears throat> pardon me. And uh, are you good with that? We'll just kind of listen to this track together. Sure, absolutely. Okay, let me let me just get this set up. And uh, and a little bit of background first of all, um, as I'm setting it up. When you recorded this, you you basically recorded this as a session musician, correct? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You were you were not <clears throat> you were not in Paul's band at that time. No. I that had no idea that it was even going to be uh, a band. It was just another gig, you know. Yeah. yeah. And the original the original recording, this is the only track that we spent more, more than one day on because Spinoza was on the original date. And then something happened with Spinoza, and he asked me for, to recommend another guitar player, and I, I recommended Hugh McCracken because I worked with him a lot. And yeah. Hugh came in, and he's on the final version. That's what I thought. I'd made a note about Hugh. I, I, um, a, a legendary session guitar player, and yeah, Brilliant. yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, that's great. You, you've already, you've already um, answered a question of mine, which was yeah. how did how did Hugh come about being on the you know? But you guys had worked together doing sessions in New York at that time, and and yeah. that's how Huey came on. Yeah, so and two or three kind of like. Uh, rhythm sections that used to get the same calls, you know? Yeah. So it was no surprise to show up on, on a date. And, uh, and one of those rhythm sections was the one you, you were going to be playing with that day. And at that time, Denny, you were, you were a busy session player in New York. I mean, that was, that was yeah. what you, you know, and I'll just say me, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people watching this probably are the same way. I mean, I, I know you from working with Paul. I mean, you, you were, the drummer with wings and, and uh, I didn't, until I got to know you, I didn't realize how deep your session uh, background goes, you know, and, and the yeah, other work you've done. The glory days. I was there. <laughs> we, we, some days we do three to five dates, you know, <clears throat> to a bunch of jingles in the morning and, and then a two to five and a seven to 10 record date. And then go play in the joint at nice at night. You know, <laughs> it was crazy. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a, what a fruitful time, you know, to be working and, and be in the studio. Well, and let's see. All you, all oh, you yeah. need was ta and all you need was talent. If you had the goods, they hired yeah. you. You know, like today, I think they protect. Uh, oh no, I got to have somebody that I know will do the job. Uh, then they they get loyal and they they stick with that one person because their 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 butt is on the line. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. It's different. Yeah, yep, I can ima I would imagine so. Well, yeah, let's let's jump in. I'm going to play it and sure. um Oopsie. I was You're playing so it earlier. Sorry, <laughs> Uncle Albert. We're so sorry if we caused you any pain. We're so sorry. Uncle Albert. There's no one left at home and I believe I'm gonna wait. We're so 
What a tune. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Denny, <clears throat> fantastic. Masterful. Now, so many questions. First question, right. I think you, you've told me this in the past, that you recorded it in, in different sections, right? It was Or the song was recorded in... I remember it as doing the whole tune, maybe rehearsing it that way, and for yeah. the sake of the edit between Uncle Albert and Admiral Halsey, because uh, Paul went from guitar to piano. I believe it was done in two sections, yeah. In two sections, okay. But so, you, but you you knew what the song was going to sound like when you recorded it. You knew what the end result uh, would be. It wasn't... Yeah, but you got to remember now, it's just uh, either Dave or Huey on guitar, 
and me. So there's, and Paul was playing either the acoustic guitar or the piano. Mm -hmm. So there was no bass. And if you listen carefully to uh, uh, Uncle Admiral Halsey, where he starts talking about all that crazy stuff, the, the butter pie, butter pie, yeah. you know, I kind of went a little nuts with a little playfulness on the bass drum. Yeah. He gave yeah. me creative license to do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, but it was, it was all based on his attitude in his vocals and stuff. And all we heard was a pilot vocal. So wow. the, the track was so bare. Uh, somewhere in my library, I have a, a bunch of uh, the original session tracks that some somebody sent me. I don't know how they got. I thought I. Anyway, somebody sent me these tracks and they were just the bare first recording of, of the song. And they're amazing just the way they are, you know, yeah. before there was a bass put on it or anything. But that Uncle Albert was the only the only track that Paul asked me to come up with a different part. Uh, cause when we started rehearsing Uncle Uncle, can I just play like a regular? I didn't know what exactly to, to play on it, so I just played kind of a regular beat that stayed out of the way. He he said, "Do you think you can find something that accents the vocal a little more and and uh, breaks it up?" So a boom, jack, but a boom, boom, the ching. Jack, get a boom, boom. He said, that's perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay. Next. <laughs> that's so I, I wondered that's you again, you, you were anticipating that's my question. Bit. Yeah, no, that's great. Cause I wondered if he, um, <clears throat> you know, when I had Andy Newmark on, Andy talked about working with John Lennon, double fantasy and John telling him, um, when in doubt play like Ringo. And I, I wondered if, if Paul had any similar type uh, guidance or, you know, like play something that Ringo might play or. No, that's how I got the gig. <laughs> <laughs> I played like I channeled Ringo and then I channeled Paul too, because his drumming, his drumming on the Cherries album, you know, junk and all those tunes yeah. every night. I mean, it just, you can see, I knew what he wanted. So it was really easy because, you know, we were, as session men, we were just, you know, they're paying you to come in and do the job, and, and, and they want great results really quickly. Mm -hmm. So where else would you go than to, to Ringo and Paul, the way they would drum <laughs> on those records? And it, it, I must say that it, it influenced uh, my parts, yet I used my musicianship and musicality to listen to the song, and like, like Ringo does, or any good, good drummer to play the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you hear this song now, Denny, are you immensely proud of it? I mean, that's probably a dumb question, uh, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Unbelievably proud. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a, uh, we didn't know what we were getting into. I'll never forget the first day of showing up for work. Uh, I mean, I did the audition and I think it was three or four days later, I heard that the word was out on the street in New York that Paul was auditioning drummers. So when I heard that after the audition, I thought, oh, no, get this job. There's so many guys that deserve it more. I was kind of new on the scene the first couple of years I was in New York, although I was flavor of the month at the time. Uh, when he called me himself, you know, I said, oh, this is Paul. I said, Paul who? <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> And he said, I want to hire you for this record. And he said, Are you available? I said, Give me a second. Let me, let me look at my book. <laughs> Stall for time while I left in the air. And, yeah, I'll be there. And in the meantime, as a side note, uh, Frankie Valido called me up and he said, Hey, listen, I'm going to the auction. The Museum of Famous People is going out of business and they have the Ringo drum kit from Shea Stadium they're going to sell. And he said, would you be interested in buying the toms and the bass drum? I want the snare drum, the festival snare, but the two toms and the bass drum, I'm not so crazy about. So I said, yeah, I mean, I'd love that, but I don't know if I can afford that. He said, well, let me see what I can do on it. He calls me up a day later. He said, I got the kit. <laughs> oh, got the man. kit. Oh, I, man. Said, I said, he said, do you want the toms and the bass? I said, yeah, how much? He said, 300 bucks oh my god 
I ran down to the store for three hundred dollars <laughs> cash. I gave it to him, and when Paul came into the studio that first day of recording, uh, he, he said, "Is that your drums?" And he does a double take on the drum booth. <laughs> There's the Beatles kit with my father's snare drum. My father's uh, he had a Leedy Broadway seven and a half inch concert shell mahogany. It was beautiful. It's still I still use it on most of my recordings. It's, it's wow, great great snare drum. So, uh, yeah, so that was it. I just, you know, I put some towels on it. I taped them up. I did all, all of the stuff that you would expect Ringo to do in a session and, and had the time of my life. We worked every day, Monday through Friday, 9 to 6. Of course, he came in at 1030 usually, but, <laughs> but we were there at 9 to 6. And um, it was brilliant. Just, yeah. I remember the first day, uh, the first tune that we heard uh, was another day and Spinoza was on that. Yeah. And we both looked at each other after he played us a song the first time. Well, this way, <laughs> lefty. After yeah. he played us a song the first time, we both looked at each other and said, Oh my God, it goes in and out of three. It's got all of this crazy. I mean, this is not your typical recording session that we're used to. So I knew it was going to be something to really pay attention to. Yeah. And you probably had no idea it was going to be what it ended up being, which was you joining Wings and and oh, becoming a band and for years. Well, actually, he had he hired three drummers for Brandon. <clears throat> he hired he wanted me to do the first week, uh Donald McDonald to do the second week, and a beautiful or another one of my favorites, Herb Lavelle, to do sure. the third week. And these are two of my idols. I mean these Donald was one of the finest drummers I, I've ever heard, any style, any anything, you know. But uh, after the first week of walk, working with Paul, he said, I let those other guys go because I know we, we've, got a, we've got a nice thing going here. I'd like you to do the whole record. Are you up for that? I said, yeah, okay. Wow. Twist my arm. <laughs> so that was that, man. We had we established the sound footing and we just went right ahead. And it, I couldn't wait to get to that. Wow. And, you know, what an amazing, you know, body of, mu uh, of, of uh, music, of material that you helped create during that time, Denny. Amazing. I, I want to just, I'm going to go back to the song for a second. And, you know, during the piano part in the middle there, I've always wondered if this is an homage to A Day in the Life, this... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Could be. Could be. It could very well be. Well, yeah. he was just, he was still uh, pangs of pain from what was going on with the breakup of the Beatles that we were not aware of at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to be a fan in those days. You know, we were going from session to session, just running like crazy. And uh, we were not aware of what was going on with him. But I think he had all of that. Uh, he he brought a different uh, sensibility to the Beatles in his in his writing and the way he presented the, the tunes and everything. It, it was such magic the way he and John wrote together and stuff. But he, he brought the musicality. John brought the the other thing. You know, yeah, I don't yeah. want to put a label on it, but but uh, right. it, the two of them together it was just absolutely magic. And he still had that magic, even though the Beatles were were, were history. When he came in here, this was him. Some of these songs, I believe, were meant to be recorded by the Beatles. And yeah. He'd had them written for a little while, but uh, things just didn't work out that he could do it with his mates. But um, it, and he was he was so beautiful in regards to he never told us what to do with the guitar. You or Dave or me, except for that one comment that he made on Uncle Albert. He never, he just, he, he do you remember in that three part documentary on the Beatles when Billy Preston showed up? Yeah. And they all, they all kind of perked up and, <laughs> and said, okay, here comes a real pro now. Let's, let's see what we can, we can pull together. You know, I believe that that's what Paul was doing in New York because. English musicians always thought the green is grass around uh, the grass is greener on the other side. You know, 
the New York musicians are much better than the English musicians, you know, and we felt that way about them, you know. So it was that crazy stuff. But he came to work knowing he was working with New York session men and they were going to be on top of their game. And so it was going to be easy. And it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, you know, you, may, you when you were talking about Paul's um, sensibility and his his uh, um, musicianship, you know, I think that came shining through just what you just said, Denny, in the uh, and the Get Back documentary where, you know, I mean, God, talk about a group of just immensely talented guys all around. But Paul really had the organizational side of it together. <clears throat> you could see that. Yeah, yeah he really was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the chair leader. Apologize for my throat. This just happened today. Um, but, you know, he, he really, um, and, I, and I, I wondered, and, and I, some of the songs that you hear on Ram, I could totally hear as, as Beatles songs, as you said, like, if the, if, the band, if the Beatles had continued, I'd have to think they would have recorded a lot of those songs. Yeah. Just another day. Perfect example of a, yeah. Yeah. Um, but what you did on, on, uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, this song in particular, Admiral Halsey, um, you know, that, that little shuffly part that you played in there where you, you know, you're, what I always loved about this song is the way you're shifting gears from, yeah. from place to place. And you're taking us along the way with the tune, you know, you're not, you're like, you're all on the adventure together, but but what you're doing is really helping bring that forward to the next spot. It's so perfectly done. And if you remember, there's a, a where the time turns around in Admiral Halsey. Yes, that yes. Was, uh, I don't know if it was an accident or if it was meant to be, but I think we did it once in rehearsing our parts, getting a part together, and and then he smiled so we just kept it in you know, <laughs> you know it was like one of those things uh yeah but it was it was so great was yeah. was there one part Denny? am i imagining that you were playing brushes at one part or was it just sticks really softly yeah um, it was stick soft it was stuck okay because in the next part i can hear you playing the tom toms and i obviously they sound like sticks <clears throat> yeah and those tom toms -tom i think it was a 13 and a 16 with a 20. No, it might have been a 22. I don't remember exact sizes, but uh, in that Ram reissue booklet, there were a lot of pictures in there, but you couldn't really tell the size of the base. Mm -hmm. They they, uh, they were great, and I just padded them up, of course, you know, which is the way in those days in the sessions, uh, most of the studios had a set of drums already. They had house drums and and they were all mic'd up and everything. So they, they, it sounded like hitting a dead body, you know, boom. There was no ring at all. Yeah. And so I, I didn't like that. I thought a drum should have two heads. It should make, be a chamber, a chamber of sound that, boom, you get a little sound out of it. It doesn't have to be long, but a tone anyway. And I like to tune my tom-toms in intervals according to the song that I'm playing, whether it's fourth or fifths or even sometimes sixths. Uh, so that kind of stuff was uh, was really important to me. And so I would just, each song, I would make sure that I got the floor tom-tom in line with the key of the tune. And once I, I had the floor tom-tom set up in, in, the, in the key of the tune, then I would take the tom-tom uh, and, and, and make that either a fourth, fifth, or a sixth from the floor tom-tom. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, great, yeah. great tip. And, and again, you know, I, I wondered, I always wondered if this was a, a house kit. <clears throat> and I think you, again, told me a long time ago that you had like a Ringo kit. Seems like there's no cymbal crashes on the song. <clears throat> uh, there or, are. There are. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a, <laughs> you're going to love this. When I left the Navy band in the south of France, I was on the Admiral of the Sixth Fleet ship. We had a band and we played for dignitaries and, and concerts around the Mediterranean. There was a 16-inch cymbal in the, in the band's kit. That didn't have a stamp on it, USN. <laughs> that became mine. <laughs> and I still have it. I still have it. So it's just a little 16 inch crash. And I had an old A22 that I bought at Manny's years ago, uh, Manny's Music in New York. And uh, that was my favorite symbol. And it had, in the end, it had chunks out of it, it had holes drilled, and it had all kinds of stuff. Tried to keep it alive. And the same with the old. 
Turkish case that I bought over at the at Manny's. I bought 18 inch Turkish case for like I think it was forty dollars each. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> Man. And, I know. and that was my that stash. I didn't have a deal with the companies yet. So that I just had a set of symbols that I used for everything. And I still have some of them. Those are the ones you want to hold on to. Well, and we're going to talk about Live and Let Die, Paul McCartney and Wings. And this was a couple of years into your time with Paul at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the band yeah. had become an actual band. We, I mean, we did a couple of tours and we, we were really tightening up because we lived together. I mean, we practically saw each other every day, whether it was for rehearsal, recording, uh, live dates, uh, appearances at our, at our press office and you know interviews and all we were we were with each other daily and so yeah we had really become a band and he uh he told us that they sent him the book uh living like the uh, ian fleming novel novel and uh, they wanted him to write the theme for it so we were all up at the house which wasn't the normal occasion he'd invite the band up to the house and We'd have the gear there. Ian and Trevor, our roadies, would bring the gear up. Let's just set, set up a, a basic set of drums, a couple of amps, and that was it, you know. Oh, I had his piano in the living room. He walked over to the piano and he said, oh, I just read the book the night before. It's really cool, but a lot of it takes place in Jamaica. So he said, so I gotta, I gotta sit down and figure this out. James Bond, there's a lot of chasing. So he sat down at the piano and went, do do do. Do, 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 do. At home. Well, that's pretty good. Do, 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 do. At home. So he's got the chase scene down. Wow. So now I got to write some sort of a, a ballad, a love thing there, because he's got a couple of girls in the movies. So, <laughs> do, 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 do. That was his thing, writing melodies. Do, 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 do. So he puts some words in it. He put some words in it. He's got that. He said, uh, there's a lot of reggae stuff in there, and we were newly into reggae deep. So, uh, what does it matter to you? Yeah. The song was written in 10, 15 minutes. So we all jump on our instruments, and uh, within an hour or so, we had our parts together, and everybody knew the form of the song. And a few days later, we're up at George Martin's studio, Air London, recording it. We had a small orchestra in there. Uh, I remember Ray Cooper was playing percussion. Ray played that. He had timpani yeah. and, and duck calls. <laughs> 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 On the yeah. reggae bit, you'll hear the rah, rah. Yeah, yeah. He, he had to put the, but it da 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 boom. He put all of those timpani beats in there with my floor tom. And uh, we were in and out of the studio with a completed track, overdubbed and mixed in three hours. Wow. It was scary. It was like really. It's like what's was, the hurry? Was that like it, it, that's and that's that's the obviously the power of you guys being a band and yeah. working so much together and uh, and was that a one take song, Danny? I know some of the no, some of the we tracks. Probably were... did four or five takes, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, but not much. I mean, we just we did a couple of run throughs to get to make sure that everybody's us. Uh, we was live with orchestra. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure Lots that everybody's parts were correct, no no bad notes or anything. And and then we started doing some takes. And I remember, I believe the engineer's name was Bill Price. Uh, but he sat in the booth and just chain smoked. It was like cigarettes everywhere. <laughs> this guy was like on. And, and George Martin was there. He'd just done the, you know, the orchestra arrangement. And, everything. and uh, it, it, was, it was flying by. And Paul put some vocals on. We got the track within at least four or five takes max. Wow. And there wasn't uh, like a bunch of edits or anything. We wanted it to be as live as possible. And we were used to recording, too, because yeah. we had carte blanche at Abbey Road. You know, we'd go in there for, for days sometimes. Or, oh, the Wildlife album was done in a weekend. Like, <laughs> five of the eight tracks were first takes. Uh, there was a little more effort put into uh, Living Like Die, though. And the way I understand that 
we sent it over to the broccoli family and they said uh, they, they own the franchise. I said, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't too happy with it at first. Oh my you know? God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's us. Oh, first time I heard it, I said, wow. Oh, I love a- playing it because if you, if you, if you play the track, you know, uh, yeah. Dum 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 All those suspensions and pushes uh, that really screws up the average musician, shall we say? Yeah. And when I was writing my drum book uh, years ago, I wanted to put that song with a on the DVD. I would play along to it, but the Broccoli family would not allow me to put that in my drum book because they said it might interfere with the new theme for the new <laughs> Bond film, which was, uh, uh, what's her name? Oh, Carly Simon. Uh, no, 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 no. no. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> she took the world by a storm. What is it, me? Adele. Oh, oh, the, 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 yes, of course. The, the new Adele, one. Yes, yeah. Adele. Yeah. They didn't yeah, want yeah. that. So, so anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't use that, but, uh, yeah, all right, cool. Yes. Just so much fun, you know. And I had I had a friend of mine chart out the drum part. And he said, <laughs> Dale, I love this guy, man. He used to do a lot of the orchestra stuff that I was doing in town at the time. He said, um, do you know that there's a 3-8 bar in that? I went, no, no way. Would there be a 3-8 bar in there? Henry and Denny would just look at that and scratch their heads. <laughs> and it, I'll be damned it's one, two, three, ba ba Right before before the entrance. One, two, three, da 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 So anyway, yeah. it was it was nice to see that thing charted out with all of those pushes and stuff. And and uh, I have done that in uh, over the years I do my drum playing. I always throw that in there. It's just such a it's a it's not I, a rock and roll piece of music. I think when you did the Chicago drum show four yeah. years ago, the same year I was there, I think you, that was part of your yeah. <clears throat> part of your clinic. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I love being, I love being yeah. able to give that back. You know, I yeah. get so many emails, and a lot of them are about uh, that track, and uh, oddly enough, a lot of them are about uh, Mickey. Uh, oh, what's that? The, the reggae tune we did on Wildlife. Oh, Love is Strange? Love is Strange. Yeah, yeah. Great song. Great My song. My version of reggae. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you when you recorded these songs, when you recorded that song, Denny, did, had you had it charted out or did you just, you, you uh, committed it to memory? You, yeah. We were a band, yeah. Yeah, you knew and the it, song. You know, it's really not that hard. There's most, if you take a look at most hit records or, or memorable songs, shall we say, there's A, B, C, sometimes a D part. So mm-hmm. if you if you get the sections and you know the running order, the form of the song, and you come up with a part for each section, it becomes a lot easier. Everybody knows that you're going to take them there by setting up the next section. Yeah. And, and it's uh, it's one of the things that, you know, just big band training, playing shows, and when I first started my career up in the Pocono, the singer, dance team, comedian every night, you know, it, all of that stuff really helped me to get my act together. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, you're, I mean, everything that you then later used, your timing and your, you know, <clears throat> everything. Yeah. So I'll play the song. Yeah, okay, great. You were young and your heart was an open book You used to say, live and let live You know you did, you know you did, you know you did But if this ever-changing world in which we live in makes you Live and let die
But if this ever-changing world in which we live in makes you Live and let die. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Now, there's the difference when I'm actually in the band where, where the bass player is Paul McCartney. Uncle Albert, he wasn't even playing the bass, but when he's playing the bass, it's so much easier. What I, I mean, I played with all the greats, and, and I love them all, I, but Paul had something so special. Yeah. It made my job so easy. He really is. Yeah. <clears throat> Probably my favorite bass player, certainly right up there in terms of like just a guy I'd love to play with just because of yeah. how he feels and, and where he puts it. And, yeah. And the, yeah. And the uh, conviction with which he puts it. Yeah. Boom. There's no question. The only other guy I can remember like that is uh, my friend Chuck DeMonica. I'll never forget being on a big orchestra date with Chuck and, and, and when he goes, boom, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, just uh, it's just like yeah nobody yeah. nobody does it better than a guy like that yeah you know where the beat is and and yeah, and that yeah. song denny was it was it like um uncle albert where the was the orchestra there live with you or was that it was oh, yeah, yeah. No, wow. george's uh, studio was a it was a medium-sized room but you could get about a 40-piece orchestra in there uh, it was tight you know but i had a, a booth around me and the front was open, but it had but it had a halfway up baffle, so that the bass drum and the cymbal went into that. But the the front was open. The sides were baffles. I'm not sure if the sides spilled out, but anyway, we had a good headphone balance, mm -hmm. and uh, and we're playing live with the orchestra. Uh, if I remember, the brass were, were furthest away; they were over in the other left hand corner, but you know by the timpani and percussion and stuff. But the violins and the cellos and you know, right over here on the right. So uh, I could play out, but I, I had to use uh, a little bit of sensibilities as far as how how much you could play out. So I didn't mm -hmm. leak into everybody's mic, you know. But we didn't spend a lot of time on it either. But they really had their, their, their stuff together, man. Set the room up. Everybody showed up, checked out the parts, and laid it down. Fantastic, and yeah. and recorded. Um, no click track, probably. No. no. Wow, the time is is. We we never use perfect. The click track. I meant to ask you that about Uncle Albert as well. So none of that was done with a click. It was all just done live, and yeah. yeah. Wow. In <clears> fact, <throat> uh, in those days, the click track was just coming into the session world. Not so much for, for jingles. I'll never forget doing a jingle one day. And, and uh, the guy says, uh, well, that timed out to 62 seconds. We need 59. Did you do that? And I said, yeah, I'll just kick it off a little faster. So we did another take, and it came out exactly right. He thought I was a genius. <laughs> but I, I didn't know with this click, it was stiff. You know, I just didn't like the click track at first. Yeah. So I went, I went to my, my dear friend, Mel Lewis. I said, Mel, how do you play with this click track? He said, ah, just make believe it's a stiff bass player and make him swing. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's a great line. That's yeah. that's a great line. Um, you know, and again, another song that that uh, it's funny that that they didn't like it because yeah. I th I think it went to number one or number two or something and nominated yeah. for a Grammy and an Oscar yeah. and. 
And just, you know, all these years later, Denny, that's the beauty of it is, you know, we listen to it. It's probably hear it every day on the radio one in one on one station or another. And, uh, it's timeless, you know, I mean, it's such an yeah. amazing piece of music that I, I appreciate it as I get, the more I hear it and the older I get, I really appreciate what you did. I believe, you brought up a great point there, I believe when we first started doing Ram, though, I remember Spinoza and I looking at each other thinking the same thought, people are going to be listening to this 50 years from now, this is, this is not your ordinary deal, you know. So I'm yeah. really proud to be a part of that. I don't know if, if the music that he made later on in the career of Wings or, you know, will have that kind of uh, shelf life. Or, or so, but, uh, but I was really happy I was there when he had all that angst yeah. that, that came out in the music. And uh, people, they hated Ram right off the bat. They they put it put Ram down. They didn't find Ram to be the, the record that it is until... Much later, when they, they say, "Oh, he's the guy that broke up the Beatles," we're not going to buy that, you know. All crazy stuff. I know. Isn't that funny? How how so many great records, <clears throat> people can listen to them when they first come out and just immediately, for whatever reason, choose to not like it. And then all these years later, it's it's by all accounts a classic. Um, you know, so so and and I think from that period, especially as you say, there were a lot of great records made that. You know, it only takes one guy or gal, but usually a guy, maybe having a bad day who decides, yeah. ah, you know, it's too this, it's too that, it, not enough of this. And uh, and then years later, people are going, this is like one of the greatest records ever made. Yeah. Hey, did you ever hear of a, hear of a critic that, uh, it, I mean, if he gave all great reviews, he wouldn't be a critic. Right. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So they have, it's like a lawyer. They have to make their own work. <laughs> Yeah. But before we go any further, I have to commend you. I saw your show with Steve Gadd, my Thank friend, you. my dear friend, Steve Gadd, who came to New York on as I was leaving to go to move to London. And I wish I would have had more time to 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 watch him fall into the scene that he did, you know. But uh, your that that show you did with Steve and that track up from Asia with his solos, you know, like you find these gems in. Uh, God bless you, man. You're really doing a, a service to the to another drummer, especially talking about gear, talking about that, 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 that. You know, you hit on all the right subjects. Thank you, Denny. Thank you. Because you're John D. Oh, <laughs> thanks, brother. Thank you, my brother. And and speaking about gear, speaking of gear, I know you mentioned um, when we were talking about Uncle Albert, the house kit. Uh, sorry, the Ringo kit. Right. But by seventy, by the time you recorded "Live and Let Die" seventy two. Were you playing Gretsch? Did you have your... Oh, always, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I traded in that Ludwig uh, Ringo kit. I gave it back to Frank DiPolito and bought my first kit of, uh, I think there were 64 uh, round badge. I had two 12s, a 14, and a 1958 uh, Slingerland snare drum. And that became my wings kit. That went on a plane with me <laughs> in, wow. in fiber cases from Pro Drum over to uh, Scotland when Paul called us over to take a vacation after RAM. And uh, the, the customs people saw me showing up in England with a, uh, in Scotland with a, with a drum kit. And they said, Where, What are you doing with this? I said, Well, I'm going up to uh, my friend's farm and he's going to take a vacation. But he said, Bring some drums along, we'll play. Said, who's your friend? And they weren't going to let me in the country. They thought I was one of the beetle nuts. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Shut this off real quick. So uh, they finally they said, "Who are you going to play with?" And I said, "Well, this guy Paul McCartney." Said, yeah, right. Okay. I said, "Well, here's his phone number. Why don't you call him?" And uh, they called him up, and he said, "Yeah, send him down. I'm expecting him." So they get, they set me up with a van. They threw the drums in our bags in the van. And we took this five hour ride through this windy road down Loch Lomond to Paul's farm. A couple of days later, he said, "I miss my old band. How about forming a band?" Wow! So uh, that's that kit that I was playing here. That's, that's the, the kit. kit was on wow. the flight to Scotland. <laughs> Man, well, and I, I used them in the early days. Wings. Yeah. Or, okay. And then later on, I remember seeing you. Um, on a TV special, and this would have been, I was thinking, I think it was 1973, 50 years ago. I had just started playing drums, I don't know, six months before that. 
Uh, and I, I, I saw you on TV and you were playing a, 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 a rosewood or a walnut Gretsch kit. Walnut. Right? Walnut. walnut. Yes. Yeah, I started out with the black kit. I they gave they gave they made me a bigger set with a 22, 12, 13, 16. And so I had the smaller version, the, the medium version. Then they made me a, a walnut kit when we started doing our European tour, I believe, which was 72. Yeah. And that was bigger drum, maybe even 13, 14, 16. No, it was 12, 13, 16. And I might have even had my dad snare them on that, the walnut kit. I don't know what happened to those two kits. I really don't. After after I left, I don't, I don't hmm. remember. But I hung on to, I had a black kit. I had two black kits, I believe, from that period. My, my little round badge and then the stop sign badge, 72 vintage. Yeah. I, I still have most of it. Although, Live and Let Die kit, for example, Hard Rock asked me if I would, I wasn't using them at this point. And uh, they they made a display of them in one of the casinos. It was nice, actually. Yeah. That's that's a People that's a, what a great by. honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, I know, was I gave them the I gave them I shouldn't have done that. I gave them the original 20, 20 inch ride and the eighteen inch K crash oh. with all the chunks out of it and the holes and everything. I gave them the real and the hi hats were really old thin uh, A's fourteen inch A's. Yeah, I should have maybe hung on to those. <laughs> I say you call them, get those back, <laughs> make a call to Zildjian, have Zildjian send them some new symbols for the display. You keep yeah. the old ones. <laughs> That'd be great. I'll make that call for you. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll crack some skulls, Denny. Uh, good. My <laughs> Najabashamen. <laughs> no, you know, I was going <clears> to <throat> just say, you know, just as we as we sort of wrap this up, What's great about, you know, especially going back to the, to the first song, Uncle Albert, you know, it was, when you think about when you recorded that 1970, I mean, it was really right after the Beatles. I mean, it was literally, they had done, uh, you know, you're talking about the documentary, which was 1968, 1969. So, you know, Paul was fresh off that. You could see he had so much, um, enthusiasm isn't the right word, but he had so much creativity and, and, yeah. uh, desire to create music that I think he had a, he needed an outlet and you were, you were part of that outlet to get it out there. Yeah. yeah some, one day somebody said to me, you know, you're the first guy Paul McCartney called to make music with after he left the Beatles. I went, wow, yeah. I guess so. <laughs> I know. Was, think about it. And, and even the same with the, he, he auditioned drummers before he auditioned guitar players. So it really was the first guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I think what you said too means so much and says so much about you that he had some great other drummers kind of, you know, ready to go and and it's not a question and I know you would never say that you were the better drummer or you were it's just he felt comfortable with you and and uh you you felt probably more, I'm guessing, more like a band drummer to him, a guy that, you yeah. know, would be part of the band. And uh I could see that. I mean, the list of, of guys like Purdy, <laughs> yeah. Ronnie Purdy and Ronnie Zito and Bill LaVorne, yeah. uh, the cats that were doing all of the work at the time, when yeah. they got called in, you know. Rick uh, Murata, our buddy? Rick, yeah. No, he wasn't He wasn't in town yet. He wasn't in town yet, okay, no. yeah. In fact, Rick, I'll tell you a funny story, because when I got the gig and I finished Ram, we, we I mean, you know, it was a nice pay, payday, the Ram album, he paid us double or triple scale. I don't know what it was. My wife and I, we had a beautiful apartment on 68th Street. We bought some fancy rugs and, and fancy furniture and a wall unit in the world. It's a piano and all that stuff. And when we left to go to England to form the band, I heard about Rick coming into town. And so I told all my jingle contacts, I said, this guy plays like me. You're going to like him. Uh, get him on your, your, your list. And I sold Rick my apartment. Uh, I mean, I didn't own the apartment, but uh, he picked up my lease on it. And I sold him all of the contents, the, the TV, the piano, the, the everything, maybe 2500 bucks or something like that. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was happy to do that. Rick is one of my dear friends. I don't see him enough, and he lives out here. There's no reason for that. But I'm, I'm just glad that I get to see Steve a lot now. Steve, yeah. yeah. 
we spend a lot of time uh, talking on the phone or on Zooms or something. That's great. That's great. And before we before we close, you know, you mentioned George Martin, and I was always curious, you know, in a, a lot of these tracks, Paul is listed as the sort of a producer of record of, of, you know, listed. I think, though, in Live and Let Die, George, Sir George, is listed as producer. But oh, maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. But with and, and, and with all due respect to George Martin, because he's George Martin, was was Paul still kind of the guy that was really sort of at the helm for the most part in terms of. Being the producer, oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, there was a, a one day when Sweetening ran. I remember seeing him sitting down. Maybe it was in—I don't remember if it was in New York or London—but he sat down with George and he said, "Now I want the trombones voice like this." He said, "I want the violas voice like this." Now, here's a guy that can't write a note of music, but at the piano. He was the one that, that guided George Martin. I want the trombone voice like this, mm. or I want the brass to play this. You know, it, it's like uncanny, his sensibilities of, of how he, how to write for an orchestra. And when we were doing the sweetening, I wasn't there for most of it, but I came the first day. I want, he invited me down to ANR 799 7th Avenue. And he took, we had the David Nadian string section, the best New York cats. That were available. And he took a long time to tune up the orchestra. And they're all looking at each other like, what the hell is this, this, this rock and roll guys? We know how to tune up an orchestra. But he spent this enormous amount of time getting the tuning just the way he wanted it. They heard the first playback and it sounded like the London Symphony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's innate kind of stuff, you know. It's one of my. My only yeah. re re regrets in life is that uh, whatever happened when I left the band, because we had such a connection musically that uh, and we're still good friends. But, yeah, yeah. You know, I really appreciated that period of time musically with another person. I never found anything like it again. Yeah, I mean, and you were you were there for some really magical moments, Denny, and and uh, you know you can. You can hang your hat on on just those two songs, let alone all the others you recorded. You know, that's right place, right time. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> and you got to have the goods as as you do. So, well, fantastic. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you. As Ringo says, peace and love. <laughs> peace and love. Right back at you. So, Denny, can you uh, maybe just talk for a minute about your um, Ram On 50th anniversary tribute sure. record? Uh, yeah. This fellow, uh, Fernando Perdomo, I kept meeting him at anything to do with Beatles, you know, gigs around town or whatever. And I thought he was one of those uh, those fans that you just can't shake, you know. <laughs> but he, he called me up one day and he said, hey, uh, I just recorded... He's got a home studio and he's a multi instrumentalist He's very, very talented, Fernando Perdomo. And so he called me up and he said, we just did a version of too many people and some people you'll never know. Would you consider coming up to my studio and uh, putting drums on? I got drums all set up. All you have to walk in. I went, hmm, I don't know about this. He said, yeah, I'll pay you for your time and everything. I said, yeah, what the hell? That's what I do well. So I go up and, and I listen to the track. It's just like the track. Wow. I put drums on in 10 minutes, maybe two passes, you know, and I couldn't believe it. So a couple months later, now we're in the COVID, and he says, hey, do you know that it's the 50th anniversary of Ram? I'm like, what? 50? So he says, yeah, it's the 50th. So anyway, he said, let's do the whole Ram album. I went. Well, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> that's, a, that's a gem. Like, why would anybody want to attempt something like that? I mean, that was magic, that record. He said, we can do it. We can do it. I said, well, let, me, let me see what Paul has to say. I call Paul. And I tell him what we're planning. And he said, sure, why not? Go ahead and have some fun with it. And that that's was it, man. So during COVID, uh, uh, Fernando had all of this it must have been close to 100 people on the record, all Gen X and, you know, 
younger groups of musicians that were all around the world, actually. Yeah. And Fernando just sent it. I, I started with putting the original drums on on things like uh, Uncle Albert, and, uh, Backseat of My Car, you know, the, the big epic kind of tracks. So mm -hmm. I would play along to the CD and I would put a new drum track on it. So the sounds were actually better because it's 50 years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he would send it out to all of his friends all over the planet and they'd put their parts on, they'd send it back to him and he'd put it together. And uh, it was released on Cherry Red Records a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, something in May, I believe it was. But it, it came out really good and uh, it's out now on Cherry Red Records. You can get it on Amazon, it's in CD and double album vinyl. All right. With a, a book that's just beautiful. It's, it talks about how the original Dave Spinoza played the original guitar that he played on Another Day. And Marvin Stamm played on the original trumpet. He played uh, Uncle Albert on. Wow. So, so great that you have those guys. Thrill. Yeah. Yeah. It was Fantastic. A and it was, it was super easy, too. I think I did all the drum tracks in three days' time. One day I recorded eight drum tracks in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, in those days, I, you know, it was probably helped you stay busy and yeah yeah exactly yeah, that was nice well done well that's great i'm gonna i'm gonna check it out as soon as we're done here yeah you'll get a kick out of it i guarantee great well thank you so much denny and uh and i look forward to having you back soon you me too thank you take care john you too buddy